Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show with a special guest today, Paul Delory from, let's see, what's the name of your outfit here? A probate. Yeah, uh, yeah probate made simple. Probate, probate made simple. Made simple. Yeah. See, and you because it was so simple, I forgot it. So, <laughs> well, welcome. This is great stuff. Um, probate is, I mean, I've had many a transaction where we're waiting on probate. You know, yeah. the, the kids inherit the home and they go, well, we're not ready to list it yet. We'll get back to you. And uh, right. you must see that all the time. Well, for sure. And actually, the situation you're talking about is probably where the parents tried to save a couple bucks and they <clears throat> they have a, a beneficiary deed having the house go to the three kids equally. So, yeah, great. They they avoided probate, but now you have three kids owning a house and, you know, the the uh, the son in Wisconsin uh, wants to get top dollar and the daughter who, you know, still lives in the house because she was caring for the parents. And then you have, you know, someone else, you know, I, actually, <laughs> actually, I have two situations right now where there's a child in prison. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, and then, yeah, tr trying to herd that group of cats and make a decision that makes it complicated. And that's ironically, it's not in probate, but it's still a tricky situation. So, well, yeah, I've seen we that. I, I know there was a, a house uh, um, next to a listing that I had, and it was grossly overpriced. And there were uh, three people in the picture, and one of them was out of state and was not going to lower their price. Now, it didn't affect me, but I was it's like, you know, this thing's going to, it's already been sitting here for six months, but it's like <laughs> spinning plates, you know? Right. There's, there's usually always one holdout. So I always, yeah. I always tell the potential sellers and people that inherited the house in advance, you guys need to agree on a price range. You know, don't, don't hang your hat and say it's worth 450 and not a dime less because right. the buyers are going to tell you what your home is worth. Right. And despite that's what you've seen. And, uh, and so that's always been the, the hard thing. Now you said that the beneficiary deed, because that's been brought up on my show that says, well, why do I need probate? I can just get a beneficiary deed from my house for my, my kids, but probate's more than just the house, correct? Well, I guess I'm talking about probate more generally uh, in terms of any after death stuff. So sure, if the beneficiary deed is going to one person, uh, assuming they're still alive uh, and assuming they're not incapacitated or you know anything like that, then sure, you can do a beneficiary deed. Yeah, that's fine. But if it's going to two or more people, boy, that gets kind of tricky. Well, well, tell me what the process looks like and what people should watch out for and why they would uh, would want to hire somebody like yourselves to help in advance or right in the middle of it. Sure. Well, uh, so so the, the the process of probate, uh, probate in here, why don't I just start kind of from the beginning? So sure. what, do, what even is probate? Probate is uh, the the, the word um, comes from, I'm not sure if it's Old English or uh, Latin or what, but it, it, it means to prove. Uh, and the idea is that you're proving the will. So if there's a will, then you're trying to you know, prove that it's the, you know, the valid last will that was actually signed by your deceased relative and that it's controlling. Um, now, what you have to understand is that there's probate assets and non-probate assets. And pretty soon, like within five minutes, I can get everyone on this podcast all comp all confused about what I'm even talking about. But let me let me just do this much. So there's probate assets and non-probate assets. Probate assets are things that are in the deceased person's name alone when they die. So they had a bank account, no pay on death feature, it wasn't joint, it was just a bank account. Um, that's a probate asset. Uh, non-probate asset would be something like a house and joint tenancy or life insurance with a beneficiary or IRA with a beneficiary, something like that. So that goes outside of probate. Now, where it gets a little complicated is um, we, we see this in Arizona quite a bit where uh, the kids are maybe um, elsewhere, like somewhere in the home state in Minnesota or Washington, and the, the parents moved here and uh, parents had a caretaker that 
became really close friends with your parents. And over the course of years, the caretaker um, somehow uh, had her name, and I'll say her, but it could be him, but, uh, you know, ha- had her name uh, put on the deed to the house. And the, and the kids don't find out, uh, out about that until years later when, when the parent dies or whatever. Well, that that's a, that's a non-probate asset, but it actually gets um, brought back into probate court because now the kids are claiming undue influence or financial exploitation or something. So, so there's a lot of little, you know, I've seen that. And, yeah, yeah. This, this, this whole area can get a little crazy, but, and, and that's why doing an estate plan is simple, but we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've seen that. And I, in fact, I knew a lady that was helping um, an elderly gal and she said, she's giving me the house. Uh, when she passes on, I'm thinking the back of my mind, does she have any kids that the kids know? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, get the house. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so are there, um, are there steps, I, I, you know, in being proactive, uh, what kind of steps could, could I take uh, prior to my demise uh, to make sure that everything's just smooth sailing? Let's say I've got a, house and i'll just make it up a car and a boat mm-hmm. and a sure. bank account so okay. what steps should i be taking yep um and so three kids. okay very good so um <clears throat> i'll talk about this from more of the standpoint of my 25 years experience being a lawyer and seeing all kinds of situations there, there's different different layers of things to do one thing that everyone talks about is to get an estate plan to get a trust, to get a will, something like that. Um, it, as long as it, as long as the document is proper, properly drafted, and uh, and fits within your your plan, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so let's just stick with that situation. Um, I had a I had a situation recently where uh, someone had a very meticulously mapped out will that said this account goes to this person, this account goes to this person and, and create a, create a trust for my dog, my beloved dog and have, <clears throat> have some of the money go here and all this stuff. Well, the problem was all the assets were non-probate assets. So the account automatically went to someone else and, and the house automatically went to someone else and, and all this stuff. So that, that ended up being kind of a mess. So when I say having an estate plan, like the whole thing needs to actually match together and, and work. So that's one layer. And the, the best way to just make sure that it's going to work is don't try to do it on your own. Work with an estate planning attorney. Yes, it's a little, a little bit more expensive, but you're going to be able to sleep at night knowing that things are actually set up right. And then... There's another layer, and I don't know if it should be below or uh, above. I'm just, <laughs> but there's another layer that just involves communication within the family, and that's really important. In, in other words, if you have, if you do your will or trust or whatever, and you keep it private, uh, don't tell anyone. It's just on your shelf at home. No one even knows about it. And then, you know, it, it's a surprise when when you pass away and someone discovers it. Well, that can create issues if. Uh, if there's conflict and, and your kids, like in your situation, the three kids, maybe you named your middle one to be in charge and the oldest one thinks that he should be. And all of a sudden you have conflict over who should be in charge and all that kind of stuff. So the, the better thing is to talk about it ahead of time. And this this goes against the grain with a lot of, um, maybe I'll just say the older generation, the older generation kind of had the idea of, you know, do it and, you know, the kids will figure it out later, but that's not really a smart way to do it because by figuring it out later there, you know, that could involve a lot of arguments and they may never talk to each other because of the, um, because of the dispute that results. Yeah. I know in my case, when my, when uh, my father was in a care center and my, and my mom had, outlined for us and said, okay, you know, Rick, I want you to handle the, the finances. Um, I don't want your sister to handle the finances. And I had an older brother. And, uh, and so we've come to find out, you know, two weeks later, she passes away. We find out that my brother is got full power of attorney, which doesn't give me any authority at all to handle the finances, which was fine because my brother's terrific. And, but she said, well, I, I do, she didn't want me to have full power of attorney because I lived in Arizona and they lived in Washington. 
So mm -hmm. otherwise files up there, she said she would have had me do it. But uh, my point was what she told us was so far different from what she actually put on paper. Right. So, yeah, but she was kind of having some memory problems too. And, and, uh, and it was kind of a, a mess. She was, we were trying to find out how much money she had because she wanted to sell the house and move into a two bedroom apartment. And she's got all these bank statements and stuff. And, and my sister's got bank statements that she sent me that she took from her cell phone and we're trying to add all this up. And then after she passed and we went in and actually looked at everything, she was about a hundred thousand dollars short of what we thought she had. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. She, she would shop CD rates. So she'd go down to us bank and find out that they were paying more than Wells Fargo. <laughs> so she'd move it. Right. So she had duplicate bank statements. And uh, so it was really a mess. But my point was sometimes they tell you, um, how they want things lined up. But on paper, they didn't quite get to that. My dad had a will and his best friend was a lawyer, lived right across from him. And the, the will just basically said, you know, that everything would be split equally between three of us, but he didn't give any other specifics on other items that he had, like, you know, who gets the car, who gets the tools. And, and my, his attorney said, well, yeah, I kind of wanted Larry to fill this out, but he never got around to it. Right. Right. Yeah, that's really common. Well, and then just in terms of advice uh, with the house, because I, I know you t you deal with um, real estate a lot here. W with the house, just deal with a um, deal with an agent who's going to listen to the attorney. That that's super important. And I I know uh, just from you know the short time I've I've talked to you, I can tell that you're the kind of person who would listen to the attorney and not go off on a um, you know a hundred percent on your own for, for example like si situations um i was in court last friday uh for an all-day trial and a portion of that all-day trial was because the real estate agent had not put the right person on the purchase contract and that was shown as an example of how the um how the per the personal representative um uh, didn't know what she was doing and all this stuff. Well, you know, there, there was actually an attorney involved. And so that anyway, it, it ended up being, being complicated and it would have been so easy to, to put because uh, uh, my client was not the one who was officially selling the house. It was actually the estate of the owner of the house that was selling it. And, and anyway, and she was selling it as personal representative. It, anyways, that kind of a thing. But yeah, that actually came up. Uh, so it's, it's kind of that level of detail. So it's, it's good to just have a, you know, strong working relationship between the, you know, the realtor and the attorney and, you know, guiding the person. So just, just yeah, rely on professionals. Has to happen early too, because as you said, you know, cause somebody can come to me and say, Rick, I want to sell this house. Um, I just inherited it from my mother. Well, then the question has to be, okay, well, um, was the house in a trust? Um, is there an attorney involved? Is there going to be probate and get all the answers to these questions? Cause normally you would just go, okay, well let's dra draft up a listing agreement and your name is Julie Smith. And mm -hmm. well, that doesn't do any good. It has to be, you can be the person that's signing the documents, y you right. know, as, as Julie Smith, POA power of attorney, but the document has to be whatever the trust name was, if they had a trust right. or the, um, the, you know, the benefactor, I mean, you know, right. they're still on the deed. You look up the tax right. records and you see that somebody else's name's on that deed. Well, they're the ones selling the house. Right. So that conversation with you is very important to call and go, yeah. Hey, I've just been contacted by, you know, Julie, she wants to sell the house. Um, who do I put down and how do I write this up? Right. Right. And yeah. And this stuff gets kind of complicated. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of addendums and complicated. And oh, yeah. Title, oh, yeah. Titles having a fit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. And spe speaking of uh, title, um, talk to an actual um, uh, title company as opposed to a title agency. I, I kind of have a preference there because title companies have a whole background legal department and, uh, it, and get an opinion ahead of time. Uh, I, I had a situation... Um, just a few months ago where uh, uh, a client came in and he wanted the, clo the closing was set for Friday 
And it was like Wednesday, you know, like this situation. So two two days from now, closing supposed to happen. Title company needs we, we title company just let us know we need to do a quick probate on the deceased husband's share. A well, quick there's probate. no yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah well so that took a few months but and, and the title company could have sorted that out. So they they came at him at the last minute and said, "Oh, by the way." <laughs> Right. And there's, right. there's nothing that happens quickly in real estate. Because the other, the other thing you have to realize, too, is that there's, there's buyers involved that have hired a mover. Oh, yeah. And so when, when you have a delay, um, I like to schedule my closings on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Um, if you schedule it on a Friday and it's a delay, nobody can do anything now until Monday. So if it's going on Thursday and there's some kind of delay, they're always out there, then you could still close on Thursday. But mm -hmm. you, you, everybody wants to schedule their closings on a Friday because they're going to have the weekend off and that's when they're going to move. There's right. no harm in closing on a Thursday. Sure. Makes <laughs> You'll sense. own the house Makes a day sense. sooner than you want to do, but you got, yeah. you got room in case there's a hiccup because those moving companies, they charge you if they're going to reschedule. Right. Yeah. And well, that's a benefit. That's a benefit of someone like you doing this a while. So that's great. Yeah. And there's also, you know, don't forget if there's three kids to, to divide by three. And what I mean by that is when, when they're not agreeing on price, if you look at the net proceeds and you divide by three, their slice of the pie didn't go down as much as they thought it would. Right. right. So you have to, you have to lower the tensions by lowering the numbers sometimes. And right. if there's, if there's an attorney involved, that makes it even better because now you get to say, Hey, I was just on the phone with the attorney. He gave me some great advice. Do you guys have a minute? Mm -hmm. And then say, now here's what we can go. Cause I learned a long time ago, there's right, there's wrong. And then there's the law. And right. so, you know, right. you, but, but it, 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 we called it, hurting cats and spinning plates, but there have to be these conversations that say, you know, we've got um, somebody that really understands the law here. It's been an attorney for 25 years and we're trying to make this go as smooth as possible. What we don't want is any delays. We're trying to get you your proceeds as fast as we can, but we got a couple things we need to button up here. Yeah. So it's funny that you said there's uh, you know, the right, uh, right, wrong and the law. Um, so <laughs> my senior attorney, years years ago who uh trained me in arizona he was in most ways very wonderful um but one one way that that uh he, he had this thing he would say that you know there's the law of common sense and if you don't know exactly what the law is well you you, you can usually rely on the law of common sense and unfortunately that came back to bite him different times so <laughs> Yeah, I, I've gone into situations incredibly confident because of common sense. I mean, in my <laughs> previous career, we had contract law because uh, I yeah. managed, you know, a bread distribution company, and and uh, and you would sit back and look at this, and then then you had to weigh the cost of litigation. You know, Rick, you're right. I had a judge tell me once, you know, you're right, but here's how much it's going to cost your company if you go forward with this. Why don't we just go ahead and settle? Um, yeah. Okay, that made sense. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he goes, you know, you seem like a reasonable guy. He goes, trust me, when I go into the other room, I'm going to beat that guy up pretty bad. But in the meantime, let's settle this. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. In no, real estate, good. It can get ugly early, though. Um, I, when there's siblings involved that are still trying to manage the situation, not just a part in miles, but um, I had one. It was just two sisters. They were both local. And one. I could never get them on the phone at the same time. And it was a house they inherited from their dad. And mm -hmm. I was selling it to a, uh, an investor. And one thought the house was worth way more than it was. It needed to be torn down and rebuilt. And they early on weren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And I remember that, and I was just helping with this listing with a, a friend of mine. And I had, I had called this gal and, uh, or she had called me and she's chewing me out. Because she said I, she never got my text message and I was given the wrong phone number and she's yelling at me. And I said, well, let's let's clear something up right now. I mean, I, I don't have to do this. I mean, if if we're going to get started on off on a bad foot right now, um, I can make a suggestion to a 
to an agent and be happy to help you because it's not going to be me. And uh, I like to clear that up right away. And she goes, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But the two of them weren't talking. It made it much more difficult. We closed in less than two weeks. So I was lucky mm -hmm. that I could get out from underneath it. There was no attorney involved. Um, it was a very distressed property on the West Valley. Uh, but it was just full of contention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think yeah, now, I, is that your correct email I have down there, Paul, at Sudden Wealth Protection Law? So, yeah, let me explain that. <laughs> I, I um, Yeah, I'm not sure how that popped up. In any event. Um, I did it. So, so my, that's fine. My, uh, my, uh, so I have two, two law firms, the Sudden Wealth Protection Law, the, the explanation with that is, that, no, it's fine. You can leave it up. I don't care. Oh, I was going to modify it. <laughs> had another one. So, okay. Um, so, um, uh, okay. Quick story. Um, back in uh, 2010, I inherited a uh, uh, large estate from my father. The long story um, that will be for another podcast, maybe. But basically, <clears throat> it was, it was, um, very significant amount of money. And, um, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I, I was a estate planning probate attorney at the time. Uh, and you know, I, I counseled other people, but I, I was completely unprepared personally. And so there's something called sudden wealth syndrome when people win the lottery or a athlete gets a, you know, big, you know, 50, hundred million dollar contract or something like that. And, and they're in bankruptcy, like, you know, a year later. Um, so, uh, I actually fell into that trap and, um, it, and what happened th there's, uh, in my mind, there's, there's not enough, uh, focus on the actual transfer of, of money or house or whatever it is from one generation to the next generation. And for the most part, um, especially in the Western part of the U S here, there's kind of an assumption that, oh, the kids will figure it out. You know, they're fine, whatever. Um, but uh, what, what I've seen, uh, unfortunately, I've seen a lot is, and I'm sorry, go, go, going off on a tangent. I'll bring it back home here in just a second. But what I've seen a lot, what I've seen a lot is that um, uh, families with, um, you know, significant money um, have the attitude of, oh, you know, well, the kids are better off because they're getting this you know, this big, you know, check or whatever, or they're getting, you know, big lump sum. So that should be fine. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the way that actually plays out, um, if, if the kids, if the second generation doesn't blow it themselves, then by the, by the time it gets to the third generation, then, uh, then the third generation blows it. And unfortunately, the thing that most people don't think about is, um, during during the during that whole time, you've ended up raising grandchildren who uh, grew up in an affluent house, going to private schools, having you know all the fancy cars and all that kind of stuff, and they don't have a work ethic, and then the money runs out. So that that it, that can actually put families or put like the second, especially the third generation, in a worse situation than if there had been no money to begin with. So but anyway, so I, I do estate planning and, and uh, com, uh, complex probate litigation with the Sudden Wealth Protection Law Part. And then I have the other version, which is Probate Made Simple. So yeah, for anyone trying to reach me, you can just reach out to Probate Made Simple and it'll come right to me. So sorry okay, for well, the long I'll story. The contact information <laughs> in, the, in the description down below if anybody wants to reach out to you. And I, uh, yeah. I appreciate you guys reaching out to me. Like I said, just the other day, I did a video called nobody wants my stuff and it seems to be a very popular topic so just to have you reach yeah. out on the blue to discuss probate I, i'm jumping all over this this is great yeah so, yeah and but, I, I did see that video that was a good one so. it was uh it was short and sweet the comments yeah i have over something like 250 comments on that one and, and uh, <laughs> youtube brings out the best in people sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well paul i want to thank you for your time and uh we will reach out again and uh and stay in touch and i hope if people need your services that they uh, contact you and like i say the information information be in the description down below so thanks for joining the show and we will talk to you again okay thanks rick let me do my little outro here <laughs>